Welcome, uh, my name is Giacomo Grastelli from Milan, and we want to discuss uh, how to monitor the patient during assisted spontaneous breathing modes of mechanical ventilation. My conflicts of interest. So we know that spontaneous modes of ventilation have advantages. Uh, hemodynamic advantages due to decrease due to the decreased intrathoracic pressure, uh, better distribution of ventilation, increased variability of ventilation, uh, better function of respiratory muscles and less sedation needs. So certainly being able to start and to properly set spontaneous modes of ventilation has advantages for uh, the patient. But also there are important and potential, potentially uh, uh, very negative disadvantages, in particular uh, patients uh, uh, who retain spontaneous breathing activity may have high respiratory drive and in this case develop uh, a ventilator induced lung injury as you can see shortly. Uh, it's, uh, there's the, the problem of bad synchrony between the patient and the ventilator so the risk of asynchronies and also uh, the risk of diaphragmatic dysfunction, which can be linked both to over and under assistance. So uh, it is extremely important to monitor the patients to avoid all these potential problems. So the first problem is um, uh, higher respiratory drive and less control on ventilatory pattern and effort. Uh, as you can see in this slide, uh, uh, here you can see the situation under control mechanical ventilation and here in pressure support ventilation, you can see that uh, the, in, in these two situations, transpulmonary pressure uh, can be exactly the same, but as you can see, the, the absolute value of alveolar pressure can be extremely different and very negative during pressure, pressure support ventilation, while it's always positive during uh, controlled mechanical ventilation. And this situation can be extremely dangerous leading to uh, what is called the vicious circle of patient self-inflicted lung injury. Uh, if we start from the increased respiratory drive, that means that the patient will develop higher tidal volume, higher transpulmonary pressure, increased esophageal pressure swings. This will lead to capillary leak. This will increase lung edema, uh, further impair gas exchange, further increase the respiratory drive and again the this vicious circle which will result in self-inflicted lung injury which is a form of ventilation induced lung injury so during assisted spontaneous breathing modes of ventilation we have to aim to some targets first of all we aim to normal oxygen delivery and organ perfusion so we have to monitor lactate and mixed venous or central venous saturation. Clearly, we aim to adequate gas exchange and compared to controlled ventilation, we should target higher values of PaO2, uh, higher, uh, lower values of PCO2 and normal values of pH. So it's more difficult to accept, for example, permissive hypercapnia during spontaneous breathing. As during controlled ventilation, we aim to protective ventilatory, uh, ventilation uh, targets so uh, tidal volume and transpulmonary plateau pressure and transpulmonary pressure clearly during spontaneous breathing since the patient has may have a very high drive it's more difficult to, to control and limit tidal volume and transpulmonary pressure and also we need to adjust properly sedation in order to avoid excessive muscular fatigue and to avoid uh, over assistance and to avoid an excessive increase of metabolic needs. So it's more difficult to set uh, assisted spontaneous breathing modes of ventilation compared to controlled modes of ventilation. And the goal of a proper setting uh, is uh, to protect both the lung and the diaphragm. So what is called the lung and diaphragm protective ventilation as reviewed in this very nice uh, paper that I've been working on together with Ewan Golliger and other experts in the field and that has been just published in the Blue Journal. So to 
achieve the goal of properly set spontaneous modes of ventilation in order to obtain lung and diaphragm protective ventilation, it's extremely important to monitor the patient. The patient must be monitored very closely and uh, we have to monitor all the components, uh, all the parameters that in some way can contribute to the development of uh, self-inflicted lung injury and of ventilation-induced lung injury. So the first point is we want to monitor respiratory drive. And to monitor respiratory drive, besides breathing pattern, which is clearly very important, we can use uh, electrical activity of the diaphragm and PO1. And I want to remind you that PO1 is extremely simple because it's uh, displayed on basically all commercially available ventilators. And PO1 is a very important parameter. It's the negative <coughs> uh, deflection of airway pressure uh, during the first 100 milliseconds of an inspiratory effort against the occluded airway. So it's not related to muscular force. It's related only to the drive of the patient. And as you can see from these slides, it's linearly related with uh, the work of breathing. So it's linearly related with the oxygen consumption of the respiratory muscle. And the target of PO1 during, for example, assisted modes of ventilation is between two and three, four centimeter water. Then we want to monitor the effort of the patient, the muscular pressure developed by the respiratory muscles. And clearly the gold standard would be the sw inspiratory sphinx in esophageal pressure. Uh, but as we know, uh, esophageal pressure monitoring is not, uh, is not performed everywhere. And it's, uh, it's not so common at the bedside, but we can, uh, in some way, we can estimate muscular pressure from again, the electrical activity of the diaphragm and uh, from the occlusion pressure and from the swings in central venous pressure. So the occlusion pressure is a very uh, simple maneuver that can be performed at the bedside. And as you can see, it's the negative deflection of the airway pressure during an inspiratory occlusion against, during an inspiratory effort against the occluded airway. And as you can see from the amount of pressure developed during, during the expiratory occlusion, we, uh, we can, predict muscular pressure and also dynamic transpulmonary pressure. And this is a very interesting uh, maneuver, a very, very interesting and, and uh, simple to, to use at the bedside a monitoring tool. Another possibility is to estimate muscular pressure from the electrical activity of the diaphragm using this <coughs> pay index that we proposed together with Giacomo Bellani again, during an inspiratory occlusion against the occluded airway. And also, this is very important because basically every patient in the ICU has a central venous line. And uh, we have demonstrated in this paper, just published in, in Minerva Anesthesiologica, that uh, the inspiratory swings of central venous pressure have a linear relationship with the swings in esophageal pressure, both at zip and with a certain level of PIP. So again, when you have a patient on spontaneous breathing, uh, please take a look to the central venous pressure uh, uh, tracing waveform, uh, because if you see deep inspiratory swings, it means that the patient is pulling a lot with the respiratory muscles. Then the third component are the usual components, tidal volume, plateau pressure, compliance, and again, uh, tidal volume is very easy. It's, it's displayed on the ventilator screen and plateau pressure can be monitored also during pressure support or NAVA by means of an end inspiratory occlusion provided that the patient relaxes the respiratory muscles. So if even during spontaneous breathing modes, if you perform an inspiratory occlusion and the patient relaxes the muscles, you can see a nice plateau and this plateau has exactly the same meaning as plateau pressure measured during controlled ventilation and can be used to estimate the compliance of the respiratory system and driving pressure. And this both during pressure support and during NAVA, as we have shown in this uh, paper published in the Blue Journal last year. So uh, from this slide, we, we can show that with an inspiratory and an expiratory hold, we can both measure plateau pressure, driving pressure, and occlusion pressure, uh, which is useful to estimate uh, 
as we saw before, muscular pressure and, uh, and uh, the uh, dynamic transpulmonary pressure. So very simple maneuvers that can be performed at the bedside. For muscle strength, we can measure the negative inspiratory force or maximum inspiratory pressure. If we want to monitor patient ventilation, ventilation synchrony, then we can analyze ventilator waveforms, but also clearly esophageal pressure or EDI monitoring is very useful. And finally, it's extremely important to monitor diaphragm function, and this can be done with ultrasonography, as we know. And in this paper, this, in this Italian paper, the mitigator showed that the thickening fraction of the diaphragm is a simple parameter, reproducible and easily measured at the bedside, which is significantly correlated with diaphragm and esophageal pressure time product during tidal breathing. While, for example, uh, the diaphragm excursions, excursions during inspiration are not related with the work of breathing, so are not relating with the swings in esophageal pressure or with the thickening fraction. So the thickening, thickening fraction is a very simple parameter that can be measured at the bedside. And in this paper, Johan Golliger showed that thickening fraction is associated with the changes in diaphragm thick, thickness and with driving pressure. So uh, with, again, with a very simple and easy uh, bedside tool, we can monitor uh, diaphragm function. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, it's, it's important to underline that monitoring of the patient during the spontaneous breathing modes is extremely, extremely important. And there are several methods that can be used to monitor both drive, effort, uh, plateau pressure, and uh, muscular function. Thank you very much for the attention.